Good evening. I'm Kate France. And I'm Tabby Tyler. Tonight, academics hate them. These two girls have unlocked the secret histories of Valentine's Day. So grab a beverage. It's time for a night in. It's that time of year. Love is in the air. People are encouraged to spend money arbitrarily on Whitman samplers and tiny stuffed bears because clearly they aren't doing enough to demonstrate their love and affection to their significant others and need a holiday to remind them that they should do something nice for that special someone in their life. And I'm going to just say that the they here are men because this holiday seems to have their wallets in its sights. Obviously, we're talking about Valentine's Day, and obviously, Valentine's Day is the only day a man can show his feelings. If I could pick one holiday to just terminate execution style, it would be Valentine's Day. It's just so dumb. But it's even dumber, Tabby. There is this rumor that it was a repurposed Roman holiday. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's just the theme of our show. You'll never believe what pagan holiday the Christians are celebrating now pagan traditions in my christian holiday it's more likely than you think <laughs> roman holidays have had more rebrands than burberry and even though it was very trendy to replace pagan holidays with christian holidays in the days of the early empire there is no evidence to support that this was the case with valentine's day but it doesn't stop people from perpetuating this falsehood anyway Valentine's Day is a holiday with lots of cultural influences, but no clear-cut path from some of its ancient origins to its modern incarnation. In fact, its history is rife with inaccurate retellings. So today, we want to clear up a few false assumptions about how and why we celebrate Valentine's Day, starting with the allegedly converted Roman holiday, Lupercalia. Lupercalia was celebrated on the 13th to 15th of February, the holiday was possibly a Sabine tradition that was adopted after the Romans conquered the Sabines. It honored cleansing, fertility, and the beginning of spring, which sounds completely normal until you learn about how it was celebrated. In typical ancient fashion, it included sacrifices, blood smearing, feasting, nudity, and flagellation. Sexy. At the Lubricol altar, a male goat and a dog were sacrificed, and their blood was smeared on the foreheads of the priests who led the celebration. L less sexy. The blood was then wiped off with wool soaked in milk, after which the priests would host a feast, making thongs from the skins of the animals they sacrifice, running around the Palatine Hill counterclockwise and naked, and beating the hands or backs of women who purposely jumped in their way so that the women may become more fertile. You know, as you do. Uh, when Constantine converted the Romans to Christianity in 313 CE, all of the pagan holidays were subsequently banned in the years to come, but Lupercalia held on for a century or so longer because people were so superstitiously dedicated to the holiday. It was not a God-centric holiday, but more of a magical tradition, so it avoided the ire of the popedom until the late 400 CE when Pope Gelasius the first declared that only vile rabble participated in the festival and fought successfully to have it removed from Roman tradition. But unlike Sol Invictus, which conveniently became Christmas, Lupercalia did not just transition into the celebration of St. Valentine. Even though historians in the past have tried to link the two, they are in no way related beyond Lupercalia attempting to promote fertility and modern-day Valentine's Day being about an exchange of goods for sex. Kate, the children could be listening. There is an interesting link, however, between both holidays and Pope Gelasius. Or <laughs> Let's clear the water here, because remember, we looked up how to say it, and the, uh, the reader said, Pope Gelasius, or Gelasius. Gelasius. <laughs> Gelasius? Gelasius, Gelasius. <laughs> We're going to go with Pope Gelasius. Gelasius. Pope like Gelasius. we too are a Google pronunciation aid. Yeah, <laughs> Gelasius. <laughs> there is an interesting link, however, between both holidays and Pope Gelasius the first. This link is my new obsession. Should I break out the corkboard in red twine? Absolutely, because I have spent hours trying to actually prove that the next assertion is true. The same pope who abolished Lupercalia 
Gelasius I declared the sainthood of St. Valentine on the 14th of February, 496 CE. Really? Nope. No. No. I can't actually say that with confidence. And that's why I'm obsessed. Um. Literally. All I did was find holes in the matrix when I was researching this. During my research, I discovered that there appears to be no available documentation to support the claim that... Gelasius the first canonized Valentine. Yet so many people are willing to just accept that he did. I hate this. I, I absolutely hate when we accept something as a fact with absolutely no good reason for that. Mm. And even worse are the historians who propagate the idea that a Christian holiday just replaced Lupercalia. NPR interviewed a historian, uh, Noel Linsky, who stated, quote, it was a little more of a drunken revel, but the Christians put clothes back on it, end quote, and implied that Lupercalia was combined with St. Valentine's Day to expel the pagan rituals. The New York Times and Nat Geo both have referenced this interview to defend their brief histories on the origins of Valentine's Day, but no evidence is available to support these assertions. Gelasius wrote a scathing letter to Roman Senator Andromachus, <laughs> doing real well with these Roman <laughs> names, Addressing his disapproval of Lupercalia, and at no point does he, quote, speak of compromise or of adopting any pagan customs. He says Christians must not keep a place in their hearts for a superstition incompatible with their faith, nor should they contaminate the dignity of their religion and the sanctity of the church. Obstinate violators are to be excommunicated, end quote. And thank you, JSTOR article, St. Valentine, Chaucer, and Spring in February for clearing that one up. What's amazing to me is that we still have his, like, can I speak to a manager letter, but can't access any written record of him adding Valentine to the calendar of saints. So our next logical step, obviously, was to reach out to a professional. A pagan and an atheist email the Vatican. We're, we're still waiting on a response, but darn it, we want to know definitively. <laughs> now, in the Middle Ages, the history of Valentine's Day becomes less a muddled mess of canonization and more about humanity's consistent desire to collect trading cards. The poet Chaucer is largely attributed to the association between Valentine's Day and courtly love. Chaucer wrote The Parliament of Fowls, which, according to Dartmouth English professor Peter Travis, quote, explores the ideals of cosmic order, political order, and erotic desire, all dramatized in a raucous debate carried on by a parliament of birds. At the end of this argument concerning the nature and purpose of love, nature encourages all her birds to choose appropriate mates, end quote. And the whole thing takes place, of course, on Valentine's Day! Which is how we get the idea that Valentine's Day is a romantic holiday. It is also the Chaucer era that gives us the advent of the Valentine's Day card. At the time, they were handmade paper favors gifted to your sweetheart. And they became very popular, but tended more towards the simple side, especially in comparison to the cards of the Victorian era. Victorian valentines were largely handmade, if not by the sender, then a stationer or person who makes and sells stationery. The valentines were extraordinarily ornate, detailed, and clearly took hours to make. They featured lace, embroidery, ribbons, seashells, beads, silver and gold appliques, and poems or notes about purity, fidelity, and devotion. Purity, fidelity, and devotion. The hallmarks of Queen Victoria. <laughs> And in 1840, Great Britain introduced the Uniform Penny Post, which meant for all the wayward romantics that Valentine cards could be mailed for just one penny. People were sending so many Valentines that postmen were given, quote, a special allowance for refreshments to help them through the extraordinary exertions of the two or three days leading up to February 14th, end quote. By 1871, 1.2 million cards were processed by the General Post Office in London. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Esther Howland has noticed that her European contemporaries enjoy beautifully ornate valentines, while she and her peers settled for poems on sheets of paper. Esther harnessed her deeply entrenched American capitalist instincts, imported paper lace and decor from Europe, and started making and selling her own, kickstarting an industry that would hold America hostage every February from then on out. 
By the mid-1850s, Valentine's Day cards were so popular that the New York Times published the following criticism that I identify with deeply. On February 14, 1856, they wrote, Our bows and bells are satisfied with a few miserable lines, neatly written upon fine paper, or else they purchase a printed valentine with verses ready-made, some of which are costly, and many of which are cheap and indecent. In any case, whether decent or indecent, they only please the silly and give the vicious an opportunity to develop their propensities and place them, anonymously, before the comparatively virtuous. The custom with us has no useful feature, and the sooner it is abolished, the better. End quote. Uh, Ouch. The New York Times, criticizing the frivolities of capitalist holidays before it was cool. But, much like many opinion pieces, it did nothing to stop the red and pink onslaught of February the 14th. The Industrial Revolution came along in the 19th century, and suddenly factory-made cards are an option. And in 1913, a little company called Hallmark Cards begins printing them like crazy. It's during this time period that another Valentine's Day staple makes its debut. The heart-shaped candies called Sweethearts emerged in 1901 and have been omnipresent in Valentine's Day iconography ever since. I really like their other name, Conversation Candies. Have you ever tried to actually have a conversation with those? Like, laid them out in order and made a sentence? It kind of looks like you wrote a ransom letter. Call me. Text me. Love me. You're the one. Be mine. Crazy for you. Playtime. You're next. (laughs) And now we've reached a point where $20.7 billion was spent by Americans on Valentine's Day in 2019. About 933 million of which was spent on cards and 1.8 billion on candy. That's an astounding amount of money being spent on what amounts to disposable luxury goods. Absolutely. And it clearly boosts two industries that are in decline, candy and print. Which is the point. This is absolutely a holiday whose modern day incarnation is dependent on capitalism. The consumer bump is so irritating. You know, maybe it's easier for me to be a naysayer about this because I live in sunny South Florida where it's not, you know, dark and miserable in February. I don't need that distraction from the bleak winter that has weeks to go. But still, forcing kids to show affection to all of their classmates just seems extra stupid. Kids shouldn't have to think about admirers and romance in grade school. So I have this fear that if I ever have kids, my kid is going to get made fun of for having a lackluster shoebox because I'm 100% not interested in A, making sure it's hella decorated, and B, not interested in absolutely stupid nonsense. Like, why do we teach kids about extremely dumb things? Yeah, I mean, my daughter is two, and we already have to do this for her school. She has zero concept of romance, and yet we still have to take part in this weird faux practice mating ritual right and not to mention it enforces gender roles from an early age boys get cool cards and girls get girly cards which is why i I try to make it for my daughter more of a hey this is a day where i can give everyone in my class something i like last year she gave everyone um spider-man valentines with wonder woman stickers and unicorn erasers no matter the gender of the child which in my humble opinion What makes more sense for, you know, a bunch of toddlers? Hi, my name is Kate, and I like cats, but I also rebuild engines. Here's a Matchbox car, and here's a cat sticker. Appreciate my interests, and be my friend. See, doesn't that make more sense? Mm Mm-hmm. By the time we reach high school, it's evolved into a popularity contest, making, you know, tons of already awkward adolescents even more self-conscious and the whole secret admirer thing sets up a precedent for normalizing stalking behavior yeah i uh was my secret admirer every year even after i had very clearly explained to him that i was not interested he would give me gifts that made me feel very very uncomfortable not because of what they were they were like just stuff But what society told me I now owed him for receiving them. 
this was further enforced by people around me, including teachers, saying to me, oh, but he really likes you. You should give him a chance. Which wrongly perpetuates the idea that relationships are transactional. Yeah, not for nothing, but he used to follow me home and hide in the bushes. So I think teenage Tabby was correct in her choices. But I I felt obligated to give attention to someone who gave me an object because he liked me, even though all other evidence showed that I, I shouldn't have. And this is what Valentine's Day does, which is why I've boycotted it. You don't have to boycott it, though. My husband and I celebrate in our own way. And I might say 10 out of 10 would recommend. Is this radio safe? Yes. My recipe for a perfect Valentine's Day. Stay home. Cook dinner. Listen to an audiobook together. Find the silliest lingerie. Hey. And, hey. And have a wonderful night. Wait. Don't imply that. This is this is friendly. This is this is family friendly. Tab, turn that off. Tabby, turn that music off. Thanks for listening yet again. Please follow our social media at Tyler and France, F-R-A-N-T-Z, and check out our other podcast, Model Memoirs, hosted by Rachel Reed. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And until next week, stay sexy.